right, well, let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for the fact that we can study the Word of God, and thank you for the revelation of who you are as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would bless this class, that we would understand more of who you are, and would be drawn to you, and appreciate you with our heart and our soul and our mind, and see your glory, and be transformed into the image of Christ through that viewing of your glory. Please strengthen me as I teach and help the students who are physically in the class and those who watch the video as well to understand. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. All right. Well, we are ready to look at the Old Testament's doctrine of the deity of Christ. And I don't have a handout for you, so you're going to have to actually take notes. Um, I mean, you can still like, take notes anyway or other things, but I don't. So this is basically no handout for you for this session. But um, we're going to, I mean, we can briefly deal with the deity of the Father in the New, in the New Testament later, but usually that's not really uh, salted. Now, um, in our analysis of the deity of Christ in the Old Testament, we're going to deal with, deal with it apologetically in the sense we're going to look at texts that those who deny the deity of Christ will have difficulty dealing with. But we're not just looking at it apologetically, we're also just presenting the evidence. So some of the passages we use are going to be texts where the deity of Christ is clearly taught, but it wouldn't be the first line argument if you were going to talk to somebody who didn't believe in it. But it's a text where it's clearly taught, nevertheless, but they would have something to kind of finagle that they try to do something with. So there's there's uh, both Paulette in terms of uh, dealing with people who deny it, but also just being, looking, at, looking at the scripture and seeing what, what it teaches um, overall. Um, now, the Old Testament has a variety of, um, well, I'm going to read you a quote from uh, Warfield's The Divine Messiah in the Old Testament. <coughs> he said, the complete synthesis of the various representations of the presentation of the Messiah waits, of course, for the fulfillment of them all in one person. But it becomes clear, at least, that the hope of the coming of the world's Savior which includes in it the more specifically defined messianic hope, is but another aspect of the hope of the coming of Jehovah to judge the world and to introduce the eternal kingdom of peace. One of the results of this is that the testimony of the Old Testament to the transcendent Messiah becomes pervasive. We no longer look for it in text here and there, which we are tempted to explain away as unexpected, perhaps intolerable exaggerations, but rather see it involved in the entire drift of the eschatological, Doctrine of the Last Things, expectations of the Old Testament, and view the special text in which it finds particularly poignant expression as only the natural highlights thrown up on the surface of the general picture. So what he's saying there is that the presentation of the Messiah as divine in the Old Testament is really just that the coming of the Messiah is associated with the coming of Jehovah himself to deliver his people, set up his kingdom. So. That there's actually a sort of pervasive overall picture to the deity of the Messiah in the Old Testament. It's kind of, so in other words, when you see a text where you see the Messiah as, as God, you're like, whoa, where did that come from? That seems really odd. It's actually consistent with the whole overall general scope of the Old Testament to see the coming of the Messiah as the coming of Jehovah himself to deliver um, and save his people. We're going to look briefly here at the very first, very first Messianic prophecy in Genesis 3.15, right after the fall of man. We just translated this a little while ago in, um, in my teaching Hebrew at PCM. Um, so that's a blessing. So here the fall has just taken place. And um, we have here, actually, it's interesting, um, uh, the pre-incarnate Jehovah, who appears to be a visible manifestation, um, which would show his actually pre incarnate Christ, which we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, he pronounces this first messianic promise uh, as a pronunciation of judgment on the serpent in the presence of Adam and Eve. Now, Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between thee, he's speaking of the serpent, representing Satan, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It would be the seed. So here we have uh, a promise. Now the term seed in the promise of like Abraham's Abraham the seed and stuff like that. 
it is um, includes the line, the, the, the line of the, the like the godly seed. Um, but seed also involves a culmination in a single person. So the seed of the serpent is, um, you know, the unsaved people, but, but not just the unsaved people. It's actually the unsaved people culminating really in, well, culminating in the ultimate seed of the serpent, the Antichrist. Um, and the seed of the woman isn't just a bunch of descendants, um, but it's a bunch of descendants culminating in one single person who is the seed. Um, and, and Eve seems to actually think that one of her first child was the seed in Genesis 4, which says she'd gotten a man from the Lord. But, um, so there's going to be a particular seed who is going to um, have Satan bruise his heel, and he is going to bruise the head of the serpent. Now, um, the, and you can see that there's, there's, so there's a single ultimate bruising that happens to the seed of the serpent, um, of Satan. So there's a, you can see even a, a person, it's not just a group, it's, it's one person who's going to be bruised. Um, Satan's going to have his head crushed. If you, if you take the head of a serpent and you <coughs> smash it, what happens to the serpent? <coughs> Does it just keep going? It's fine. You're dead. The serpent is dead. So there's going to be destruction of the serpent here that this seed is going to accomplish. And the destruction of uh, Satan would necessarily involve the destruction of sin also. So this, this um, because that's how Satan you know, has his, is able to, in, in God's righteous judgment, he's over the world because sin has entered the world. So this seed is going to destroy sin and destroy the serpent. And it says that he's going to do this in connection with his heel being bruised, which, um, as a poisonous serpent here, would be, um, you could say, through his, his mortal wound. Um, so through the mortal wound, the bruising of the, the, the heel of the um, seed, he, there is going to be destruction uh, to Satan and his seed. And so um, basically it's through the death of Christ there is going to be the defeat of, of sin and Satan. Um, and so here, uh, a promise of a mortally wounded Messiah, who is seated the woman, which fits in with uh, the virgin birth and ultimate, ultimate fulfillment, um, is going to destroy, he's going to be truly human because he's going to um, be of the woman. But nevertheless, he somehow is powerful enough to be able to destroy sin and utterly to take care of sin and utterly take care of, of Satan, which really requires his deity. Now this, for example, this is a text where really um, the deity of Christ is involved in the text, but it wouldn't be a text I would use with somebody who is an anti-Trinitarian, because he's going to just say, no, no, it really isn't. Somehow non-deity can destroy sin and take care of all sin and take care of Satan. But, but really, if you're, that doesn't really make sense to say that non-deity can ultimately destroy sin, um, which is an infinite crime, and ultimately take care of, of Satan. But that's just a little background for, for Messianic prophecy. Now, the first big group of passages that we're going to be looking at for the deity of the Messiah, and here, I think these are definitely ones that um, anti-Trinitarians do have significant problems with, are the texts that refer to the... Um, angel or messenger of the Lord. The Lord of Jehovah, the messenger of Jehovah. Now, uh, the Hebrew word angel or messenger is malach, and it means, well, it means messenger. Frequently, <coughs> the word angel refers to the created category of beings that we think of as angels. But that created category of beings has that name because they, God sends them out to do stuff. So, angel, the word malach, messenger or angel, doesn't only designate in the Old Testament a created category of beings that God sends out to do stuff. Um, the word is used, the word messenger, angel, or malach, just like the New Testament word angelos, the Greek word for angel, 
is used for human messengers as well as that category of being called angels. So the word mess, it just means messenger. Now since the, the, the King James translated angel of the Lord the whole time, I don't have a problem with that the translation. But when we speak about the angel of the Lord, he's actually not in this created category of angels. He's Jehovah's special messenger, and we're going to see that he's um, identified as deity, actually, um, because the, the angel of the Lord is, is the pre-incarnate Christ. But um, uh, that is, but just you want to get out of your mind the idea that the, the use of the word messenger uh, requires um, this, it, only for this category of angelic beings. It's used for um, human messengers that are sent. Um, what passage that comes to mind? We're not doing a comprehensive study of the word Moloch, but that would be hard to dispute if you looked at Moloch. Like one that easily comes to mind is when John the Baptist sent, and this is the New Testament obviously there, but when he sent um, messengers to Christ saying, you know, are you the one who's to come or would we look for another? It's the word angelos, angel. Now, John the Baptist didn't get, get you know, two heavenly angels and send them to Jesus, you know, these are just messengers. And you can see in the Old Testament also the word um, Moloch is used um, for human messengers. So, uh, this person is called the angel of Jehovah. Now, you can see in the use that he is of Jehovah, that he is distinct from the Lord. So this angel of Jehovah is distinct from Jehovah, just from the fact that he's the angel of Jehovah. And nevertheless, we're going to see he's also identified with him. Now, there are lots of texts that refer to uh, the angel of uh, Jehovah. <clears throat> oh, one other text in terms of distinction. Take a look at 2 Samuel 24.16. In 2 Samuel 24.16, Jehovah actually addresses the angel. So that's clearly distinction right there, that he speaks to the angel. So here... Um, there's this plague in Israel, and um, it says in verse um, 15 and 16, So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba, 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, uh, the Lord repented them of the evil and said to the angel to destroy the people, It is enough, stay now thy hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of around the Jebusite. So here, the Lord actually addresses uh, the angel of Jehovah. So clearly distinction. So there's a distinction um, in the term of in 2 Samuel 24, 16, and many other texts. It's, it's difficult to argue that there's not personal distinction uh, in the angel of Jehovah from Jehovah. So if the angel of Jehovah is deed, which he will, we will show that he is, then modalism is done. So no modalism because the angel of Jehovah is distinct. Now we're not going to look at all the texts of the angel of Jehovah because that would, um, you could spend many hours on that. But we're going to look at um, some of them. So for example, take a look at Exodus 23. This is just one other text. Well, first, this is one other text where we, uh, one more distinction passage. Then we're going to look at the, some texts of the deity of the angel. So Exodus 23, 20 through 23. Here actually you see that the angel of Jehovah is uh, the mediator um, of, the, of Jehovah to Israel. And you can see that in other passages too. So just like the New Testament presents Christ as the mediator between God and man, um, the angel of Jehovah is presented as the mediator between Jehovah and Israel. So here, uh, start of verse 20. He says, Behold, I send an angel before thee, to keep thee in the way, and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies, and an adversary unto thine adversaries. Uh, for mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. So you can see, clearly, there's a distinction between Jehovah and this messenger, this capital A angel. Um, Jehovah sends the angel. The angel goes before Israel and to prepare their way. 
Uh, Exodus 32, 34, you stay here, but Exodus 32, 34, Jehovah also says, my angel will go before you. So here, he's the, he belongs to Jehovah, he's Jehovah's angel. Nevertheless, though, um, notice that when the angel is with them, um, Jehovah's presence is with them also. Um, so, uh, for example, it says also that his, his name is in him, so Jehovah's name is in the angel. Jehovah's presence is with, when, when the angel is with them, Jehovah's presence is with them. Um, you can see here. And actually, um, Jeho this angel is the one who brings them in to the promised land. Uh, take a look at Isaiah 63 and verse 9. And um, just in terms of, there's there Isaiah comments on this text here. In all their affliction, uh, the children, this is, uh, he was afflicted, and he is Jehovah in context. And the angel of his presence saved them. So the angel of Jehovah here is the deliverer of Israel. In his love and his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. So here, uh, the, 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 you see the identity of the angel of his presence. So uh, where the angel was, Jehovah's presence was there. So there's this identity of the angel of Jehovah. Also, in Exodus 23, we see that the angel brings them into the promised land. And I think a text where we actually see this happen is Joshua 5. So here, in Joshua 5, verses 13 through 6 2, this the, this personage who appears would be the messenger of Jehovah, the angel of Jehovah. So Joshua 5, there's a very interesting progression here, in 5, 13 through 6, 2. So here they're by Jericho. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And that would be a natural question if you see a guy with a sword drawn in his hand to ask him, you know, what are you, what are you doing, man? <laughs> All right? So he asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? And then the, the man with the sword in his hand said, And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And so basically, no, 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 no. You're actually on my side. It's not, am I for you? Uh, are you, in, uh, you know, you're, you're actually in my army. I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. So it's not a thou for us or for adversaries. You're actually for me. And so this, this person says that. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? So here he bows down. Um, and it's possible this is, this is true worship at this point. But I don't, you can't push too... In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word translated worship or bow down Unlike, the, remember we look at the New Testament word, it's always true worship. In the Old Testament, the word is more general. It can be used for bowing down in front of kings to human kings. So that doesn't necessarily require the deity of this person. But in any case, he says, so Joshua bows down, shows at least reverence, maybe true worship to this, this personage. And then the captain says in verse 15, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now where... Actually, in the book of Exodus, do you see someone saying, Loose your shoe from off your foot, for the place where on thou standest is holy? Burning bush. Burning bush. So this captain, the host of the Lord, is saying, I'm the one who is in the burning bush. So verse 15, the, this person is saying, I am deity. I am the one who is in the burning bush. I am Jehovah. And so, there's verse 15, 13, there's this guy with a sword on his hand. Verse 14, he's the captain of the host of the Lord. Verse 15, I'm God. I'm Jehovah. Now, the, the, we'll keep going here in the con. It says, now Jericho was straightly shut up because the children of Israel and none went out and none came in. 6-1. Verse 2, and the Lord said unto Joshua, see, I have given unto thy hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty of hell. Now, who's talking in verse 2 based on the pre-context? Who is just speaking to, jo to Joshua in, in verse 15 of chapter 5? Yeah, the, 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 the captain of the Lord's host is speaking to him, who is the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
So in 6.2, the Lord who's speaking to Joshua, Jehovah who's speaking to Joshua, is the captain of 13, verses 13 to 15. So the captain shows up and tells Joshua, this is how you take Jericho, chapter 6. All right. So the captain of the host of the Lord here is distinct from Jehovah in that he's the captain of Jehovah's hosts, but he also is Jehovah. Um, he's the one who's in the burning bush, verse 15. He's the one who's speaking in chapter 6 and verse 2. And so the Old Testament simply calls him Jehovah. So, and, and so here this is a text for the deity of the Messiah in the Old Testament. But also this person is the angel of his presence who is predicted in Exodus 23. So the, the messenger of Jehovah, the angel of Jehovah, is this God. Um, so who's leading them in? He, here this captain is leading them in the land of Canaan. That's what the angel of Jehovah is going to do. So here you have the deity of the angel of Jehovah. Any questions on how that, that works? Now, like some of that, that's that if you actually are honest with the Old Testament, that's clearly what it's saying. But if you want to find a reason to get out of it, you'll you'll just say no, blah blah. blah. But but if you just read the whole Old Testament and are honest with it, you can see that this is what's going on. Um, now, uh, there are many other texts where the messenger of Jehovah is clearly identified as um, deity. So, for example, look at Genesis 16. Genesis 16, 7 through 13, we have the deity of the angel of the Lord. Here, Hagar is thrown out from Sarah's house. And it says in verse 7, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to shore. And he said, Hagar, Sarah is made, whence comest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of a Mr. Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt cause an Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the prisons of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? So here, um, the messenger of Jehovah says, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. So the mess, and that's the Abraham covenant. Or, because uh, Ishmael, although he's not necessarily in the, in the promised line, he's a physical son of Abraham who gets his blessing. So the messenger of Jehovah is the one who actually can make the Abraham covenant happen. But God is the one who made the covenant with Abraham. So he's deity. I'm going to multiply your seed. This messenger has the power to do that, which is only the power of deity. Furthermore, um, when uh, Hagar sees the angel of Jehovah, she says in verse 13 that it was Jehovah who was speaking with her, and it was God who was there. And she says, have I also seen God who sees me? So verse 13, Hagar recognizes the deity of this person who she is speaking to. The messenger of Jehovah is his deity in verse 13, and I'm, I'm seeing God when I see the messenger of Jehovah. Um, if you take a look at Genesis 22, you can see the deity of the angel of Jehovah again. And the angel of Jehovah is never identified just as one of the category of beings that are his, God's messengers. He's always different from that. Um, he's sent from the Father, but he is not identified as just a normal angel, like Gabriel or something like that. Now, in 22, 11 through 18, we have this, um, you know, the story of, of Abraham offering up Isaac, or being willing to do so. Now, the angel of Jehovah tells Abraham, stop, no, don't do that. You can see in verse 11, it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven, unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. So notice here um, that the, the offering of Isaac was going to be done to the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord says, you have not withheld your son from me. Um, so he is the one who actually Abraham was going to offer his son to. Um, and so then Abraham looks and there's this thicket here and he offers the ram. Um, 
And the angel of Jehovah in verse 15 calls to Abraham a second time and says, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. So the angel of Jehovah speaks on behalf of God. Uh, but because thou hast done this thing, and it's not with all thy son, thy only son, then in blessing I will bless thee, and so on. So here again, and, and then because thou hast obeyed my voice. So here again, the angel of Jehovah says, I am the one who gives to Abraham a covenant. You didn't withhold your son from me. Those require deity. Um, you know, Reuben couldn't say something like that. You know, I'm the one who gives the Abraham covenant, and your off offerings are made to me. Stuff like that. Um, if you take a look at Genesis 28, 10 through 18, here Jacob goes out and he uh, goes to sleep, puts his head on the rock, um, and he sees um, this ladder. Um, going up to heaven, and it says, Jehovah, in verse 13, stood above the ladder and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac, the land where thou liest, and thee will I give unto thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and I will keep thee, and so on. So he sees Jehovah here above this um, ladder in his dream, and he names the place Bethel, which means house of God. In, um, in verse 19. So he sees, uh, in verse 17, he says, this is a dreadful place, this is the house of God. So he sees Jehovah in the stream, and he says, wow, this is the house of God. I'm going to name this place Bethel, meaning house of God, because Jehovah is in this place. Now, if you look at Genesis 31, 11, 13, in Genesis 31, 11 to 13, um, the angel of God speaks to um, speaks to Jacob. And this is what the angel of God says in 31, 11, 13. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and he said, I said, here am I. Then he said, lift up thine eyes and see all the rams which lead, leap upon the cattle, ring streaks, speckled, grizzled, for I have seen all the land that doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, where thou vowest the mountain to me. Now arise, get thee out of this land. So here the angel of God says, I'm the one who appeared to thee in Bethel. I'm the God of Bethel. So the angel of Jehovah says, I am the one who appeared to you in Genesis 28. I am God of the house of God and um, return to the land of kindred. So Genesis 28, Jacob sees Jehovah at Bethel. In Genesis 31, the angel of Jehovah says, I'm the one who actually appeared there. I am the God of Genesis 28. Now, theological liberals will say that these texts where the angel of Jehovah um, is identified as deity, well, they come up with all kinds of ridiculous things. But one thing they'll say is this shows like an early polytheism in the Old Testament. See, the, poly well, the Old Testament was really monotheistic, or only later. While early on, while you know, Israel was developing out of paganism and polytheism. So this is like a remnant of early polytheism, but that's just foolishness. And uh, if you, you know, right, believe the Bible is inspired, obviously you reject that kind of nonsense on hand. Um, and if I'm dealing with somebody who doesn't believe in the deity of, uh, or the inspiration of scripture, you need to get that settled first. I mean, what's the point of arguing about the angel of Jehovah who doesn't even believe the Bible, you know? Um, but anyone who recognizes the inspiration of the Bible, you know, this, this messenger of Jehovah is identified as deity over and over again. Uh, a good, this is a clear one. Like, this is one that, that if you, this is one that would, it's, well, all of these are difficult for somebody who denies the deity of Christ to be out of, but this is an especially difficult one to kind of uh, escape. Now, here in Genesis 32, 24 to 30, uh, this is where Esau, he's going to meet Esau the next day. Now, here it says, And Jacob was left alone and wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. So Jacob's wrestling with some man here. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hall of his thigh, and the hall of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled him. So they're wrestling all night, and then at the end, this man just touches his thigh, and it breaks. All right? And he said, this is the man wrestling with Jacob, let me go, for the day breaketh. And Jacob said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, this is the man, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, what is thy name? And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask that for my name? And he blessed him there. 
And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which means face of God. So Peniel means face of God. Pen is face, um, L is God. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, talked upon his thigh. So here this man, Jacob wrestles with this man <coughs> all night. The man then touches his thigh. His thigh gets out of joint. And the man has the authority to bless Jacob. And the man, Jacob says, this man is God. I was seeing God face to face when I was...